All right. Good afternoon again, everyone. We are about 2.01 Eastern time, so we will go ahead and begin today's event. So uh, good afternoon for most of you, and good morning to some of you on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Adam Ash. I'm with OJGDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And you have joined us for Fostering Hope and Healing, the Role of Resource Parents in Supporting Family Recovery and Reunification webinar. And before we begin, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to go over a few features of the Adobe Connect platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, we want to remind everyone that the webinar is being recorded and it will be published on Intact's YouTube uh, page. If you want to refer to it later on, it will be available for archival on YouTube. Uh, we also do have our past webinars host, uh, that we've hosted on Intact's YouTube page if you'd like to reference those. Uh, we also have the availability of the transcript and supporting materials by contacting the OJJDP TTA help desk uh, at the email address on the slide. As mentioned earlier, there are availability of handouts in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can uh, access those by clicking the name of the file and then clicking the download button. I uh, want to remind everyone at the end of the webinar that we will have a Q&A session, so please enter in your questions as they arise. We will address those at the end of today's webinar. Again, you can access, uh, enter your questions in the chat pod as they arise. Uh, for those of you who are joining today as a group, please take a minute to help us count. Type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. You can do that in the chat pod. And I'll give our participants two, two or three seconds to do that, and um, then we'll move on here. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll be provided with a certificate of attendance. Please keep an eye on your email for that certificate that will come to you via an Adobe Connect thank you email. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll also be provided with a brief link to an evaluation survey. We ask you take about five minutes to complete the evaluation. This helps us with our future trainings. And again, this is the fostering hope and healing the role of resource parents in supporting family reunification uh, and recovery. At this time, I want to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Russ Bermejo, with Children and Family Futures. So I'll turn it over to you, Russ. Thanks, Adam. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we know that training is an investment of your time, and um, we hope that um, you will get a return on your investment today. And usually in these webinars, if you can have one or two key takeaways or an aha moment or a light bulb, then I think it would have been worth um, the investment. So we're hoping that, um, that you'll find this information informative. Um, this topic of um, the role of resource parents or foster parents we're going to use those terms interchangeably, but for the most part, we're going to refer to them as resource parents. I think reflects kind of this wider shift that we're seeing in the child welfare system, that there um, currently is this reimagining, this re-envisioning of, of the foster care system and the child welfare system, um, which is going to focus really on, one, family preservation and trying to keep kids in home. Um, so with that, that's going to, of course, have an impact on the, the foster care system. Um, we think that as there's a greater focus in on unnecessary removals or family preservation, that the, the kids that will come into care are probably going to be um, families that have higher needs. And these are the needs, that, these are the kind of families that um, family treatment courts are poised to, to serve, especially those that are um, affected by um, substance use disorders. I want to first acknowledge that this um, topic is a really begin the start of a conversation. So it is a relatively new topic for us, but we've been talking about this for a while. You know, as we talk about expanding our partnerships, we think that um, resource parents have been an untapped resource for a lot of family treatment courts. But we've also been hearing a lot of um, a, a, a lot of issues regarding um, that that partnership. So um, we started hearing things in terms of how can we um, better engage them in, as part of the team? How can we engage them to support the goals of active reunification and, and family recovery? <clears throat> we know that resource parenting is very difficult, if not arguably the, the hardest job in the 
in the um, child dependency system. Um, but we know that doing that um, with a family that's un undergoing um, recovery or in recovery, is struggling with substances, is um, additionally challenging. I also want to acknowledge that, um, that kinship caregivers is a unique population. So for the most part, we're going to talk about resource parents in a very broad um, sense. And we think that um, kinship caregivers have the unique needs, and those are that's really a separate conversation that demands its own time and discussion. But um, we think that some of the um, issues or the um, areas of discussion that we're going to explore today apply to um, relative caregivers as well. I want to welcome um, anyone that's actually been a foster parent themselves. I was looking at the registration, and it looked like that there were some um, resource parents. So if you are one and you feel free to identify yourselves um, in the chat box, maybe the community or state that you're from, um, we'd love to identify you for um, the work that you're doing. Um, when we're talking about kids in care, um, fostering or resource parenting is the frontline intervention for, for this. So in order to have a, an effective child welfare system, in order to have a, an effective family treatment court, we're really going to have to strengthen our partnerships with this valuable resource. Family treatment courts are, are making um, family treatment courts are um, in many ways can lead the way in terms of how we um, train, how we support this valuable resource. So we want to highlight three sites that have, are that are doing um, great work. And they're still in process, so we'll hear some of those areas of where they've achieved, but some areas where they want to um, work on in terms of engaging resource parents. Um, we have Darcy Bird from Lafayette Parish in, um, in Louisiana. We have Antoinette Davis um, from Milwaukee County in Wisconsin, and Dr. Orrin Wonderman from Miami-Dade. And um, please feel free to... Um, to submit your questions via the chat box as we're having this conversation. Um, feel free to submit your questions to them and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, I have my coffee cup here and really we're trying to um, approach this as a very informal discussion. So we're not, um, none of our presenters are going to present any kind of slides. We're really having a conversation and we're hoping that this will inspire you to have your own conversations amongst your team. Um, before we introduce the panel, um, have the, uh, the panel introduce themselves with more detail, I want to start with a polling question. So Adam, can you fire up that polling question? Kind of wanted to get a sense of where you're at in terms of engaging and partnering with resource parents. So feel free to submit your response to this question. Select one or two areas that you are struggling with the most in regards to partnering with resource parents? Is it um, the role of facilitating quality visitation or a family time? Is it building and maintaining connections with birth parents? Is it shared or co-parenting? Um, establishing an agency philosophy? Um, is it recruitment, training, and support? Or is it actually um, engaging them to have a voice or an active role on the team. And if none of those capture um, any of your experiences, please feel free to submit um, your response in the chat box. Let's take a few moments to submit. And I think you can reply to more than one. Is that correct, Adam? So one or two areas? Yes, they can select uh, multiple areas here, more than one. Correct. Take a few moments. Thanks for your response. Here, submit. There should be a submit button. Yep. I'm just tracking the chat box here too. Okay, Adam, feel free to close the poll. Um, looks like we have. Looks like we have about four responses. Maybe with the top response being building connections maintaining connections with birth parents, and then followed up with um, quality and frequent family time, recruitment training and support, 
and giving them a voice. So these are some areas that we want to explore today. Um, so you'll see on the webcam, um, we have Darcy and, and, and Oren on via webcam, and Antoinette is joining us not on, um, on web, webcam, but via audio. So why don't we start off with um, Darcy. And the question that I want to pose to each one of them is, tell us if you can just introduce what you do on the team um, and the role that you have. And would like to hear why this particular topic, this particular issue of um, resource parents is particularly important to you, either personally or professionally. Um, so why is this important to you? Um, let's start with Darce. Uh, good afternoon. Well, afternoon in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, my name is Darce Bird. I'm the coordinator for the Lafayette Family Preservation Court. Uh, we serve both men and women of children who have come to the eyes of the state and mainly Lafayette Parish, but we will take from Vermilion and Acadia Parishes too. Um, one of the biggest reasons that I believe that shared parenting is so very important is that uh, I myself am an, an adopted foster parent. My daughter was placed with us when she was three years old. Uh, we did not have the chance to meet her parents, but we did have the ability to reach out and search for um, former foster families. And unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, we were my daughter's sixth placement, and she was only three years old when she was placed with us. Thus, uh, we, we sought out a former placement who was a respite placement for her. That placement was able to give us a lot of details about her, what she knew about her childhood and about her, her biological family. Um, we uh, created a relationship with her. We, to this day, and my daughter's now 12, we, to this day, still speak to her if we have any questions about what she might know, because she lives in the area that my daughter's biological family lives in. Um, we, we will ask questions. Uh, so I, I really think it's very important that biological families and, and foster families keep in touch and understand that we're in this for the children, for the best interest of the children. When I see that the parents that we work with in our courts working side by side with the parents, and I mean the foster parents, and what it brings to the children's lives and when the children are reunited and those foster parents are still playing a part in their lives as caretakers, respite you know, helping them along the way should a financial issue come up or just mom needs a break for the weekend and they take, you know, they take them for the weekend. That, that's such a blessing to both the foster parent and uh, the biological parent. And so from day one, the, the judge that we work for, Judge Aponche, has always been an advocate for shared parenting. When QPI became a pilot in Lafayette Parish, he was on the ground floor bringing it and pushing all the principles. And uh, it, it's, been really, it's been really working well in our area. Thanks, Darcy. Um, um, let's talk a little more about QPI um, um, later in this call, but um, really appreciate your, your personal story um, and experience, which I think really, you, a lot to the table in terms of your role there in the family treatment court so thank you for sharing that um, again if you want to read more about any of our presenters um, feel free to download the um, the webinar I mean the webinar agenda and you'll see the full bio there um, why don't we go to Antoinette um, Antoinette what do you do there in Milwaukee County and um, why is this topic important to you so good afternoon everyone I'm sorry my voice is um, a little rough here today. However, I am um, Antoinette Davis. I'm the Family Drug Treatment Court Supervisor for St. A. And what I do is oversee um, seven case managers who work um, specifically with families whose children has been removed due to um, substance use disorder. Um, I think this topic is very important. As, as Darcy said, it's very important for children and for resource parents to know 
the biological parents. Um, whatever may happen, whether it be reunification or um, or an or alternative plan to the children returning home, I think it's important for resource parents to know the parent's history in order to better parent their child and for them to always have those connections because children oftentimes wonder when they're adopted or when their parents are not around. Where are where are they? You know, and it causes intense trauma. It causes more trauma to children it, when they don't know where their parents are. So I think it's really important for resource parents and 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 bio parents. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. And parents, not bio parents, but parents to understand that they're in this together, not just for the children, but for the family. So that's that's all I will add to that. I just think this is a very important topic to keep families together in any way possible. Thank you, Antoinette. Um, in this together, that's um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Oren, are you? I know that you're on online, and if you could start your webcam again, possible. If not, then just feel free to um, proceed on with your with your response. But um, what do you do there in Miami Dade, and um, why do you care about this topic? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Oren Wonderman. At the moment, I'm not quite sure how to start my webcam again. Um, so I'm sorry for that. Um, I work at an agency called Family Resource Center of South Florida. Um, it's a combined uh, foster care agency, child welfare agency, and community mental health center. I've been working here since uh, 1995. Um, the subject is near and dear to me because uh, I adopted my son uh, 31 years ago from the state of Florida, and I adopted my daughter 30 years ago from the state of Florida. Um, and it's um, and it's been two of the greatest joys of my life. Um, and so the idea of adoption and adoption working out is something very important to me. And having worked in foster care for most of my professional career, if the camera goes back on, you can see I'm kind of long in the tooth. Um, I can tell you that the, the foster family, the foster parents are absolutely key to having, um, having this process work well. The foster parents can act as anchors, they can act as supports, they can act as guides, they can act as mentors, they can act as shoulders to cry on, they can be a vital resource to the struggling parent, uh, especially, especially in those early stages when the parent is angry, the parent is resentful, the parent is afraid, the parent is dealing with a system that's foreign to him or her. Uh, because they're now in a dependency system and not certain if they're ever going to get their children back. So I do think that foster parents play an absolutely key role, and I think that we in this line of work need to make sure that when we train our foster parents, we manage their expectations well, and we give them a vast, deep tool of, of parenting tools to work with. So we have to make sure that we manage their expectations in the sense that they do not uh, they do not think that every time they're going to get this perfect child with no problems and with an entirely cooperative uh, biological parent, um, and, um, and, they should, and they should know that sometimes they're going to deal with angry people in the beginning. Uh, but I think we should give them very deep, sophisticated tools as, as far as being patient, as far as taking a very long view about guiding people and mentoring them. Uh, and then, in my experience, at least here uh, here in South Florida, we're able to reunify the the, uh, the children with the parents in the neighborhood of 70 to 75 percent of the time, and then the other 25 to 30 percent of the time there is a termination of rights, and then we do adoptions. We do between 150 and 200 adoptions a year. Thanks, Lauren. Um, just for clarification, just to get context. Um, for the audience, um, Miami-Dade is privatized child welfare, correct? Or for the state of Florida? Yes, that happened in the summer of 2005. So your agency is one of the providers, correct? 
We're one of the three provi providers in Miami-Dade County for that service, yes. Got it. And is it Milwaukee or is it Lafayette Parish of Louisiana that has also privatized care, um, child welfare? It's Milwaukee County. Milwaukee. Okay, we're not privatized. And in Louisiana too? No. Yeah. Yep. So, so Milwaukee and I mean um, Wisconsin and Florida. Um, so um, Orrin, if you want to um, get your IT support to help you get back on camera, you have a few minutes before we get back to you. But wanted to start up with Darcy, and can you tell us um, any innovations or what you think you guys are doing well in terms of engaging? foster parents for building the connections between um, resource parents and and birth parents. Um, what are you doing in Lafayette Parish that um, you're excited about? Um, we, uh, we brought QPI to Lafayette Parish in 2016. And, and since then, I think... I'm sorry, um, uh -huh. QPI stands for what, Darcy? QPI? Quality Parenting Initiative. Got it. Okay. Yep. Uh, and that was brought. We were us in Covington, uh, Saint, which is Saint Henry Parish, where we were the two pilot programs. Uh, since then, I will have to say that our region, which is Lafayette, has done a really great job of training new foster parents and engaging them with uh, with bio parents and just in making them part of the parent's treatment plan versus you're the foster parent, you're the biological parent, and we're going to separate you both, and that's it. They now are both, they're co-parenting, they're, share, you know, it's, it's a family unit now. Um, they're looking at it as, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but um, the, the foster parents are knowing, the parents are coming in that, they're going to be shut down at first. They're scared. They don't understand, you know, what's going on. They don't, you know, a lot of times they're in denial. Um, and they just feel that these pa the foster parents are there to take their child. They want to adopt their child. And what we're having the fa foster parents understand is that's not, that's not what you're here for. That's not what QPI stands for. You're here to help this parent. We're here to reunify this parent. And with that, they've started doing from the beginning, within 24 hours, we do the initial phone call with a foster parent and the biological parent call each other. At that point, the biological parent is allowed to ask the foster parent questions. The foster parent can ask the biological parent questions. They can just talk back and forth, learn about the child, their likes and their dislikes. Uh, do they have a favorite stuffed animal, a favorite blanket, a favorite book? Um, there's meaningful uh, transitions, meaning that whenever we're going back into the home, it's not that we're just going to take the child out of the foster home and put them back in the bio, with the biological home. There's, there's a plan of transition so that the child doesn't feel like they're hurting either the foster parent or the biological parent. They're not in a tug of war anymore. Um, but also, I, we as a court, in our court, we involve the foster parent in any extracurricular activities that we do outside the courtroom, Easter egg hunts, Christmas parties. Um, we've done bowling activities with our parents. We always make sure that the foster parents know that they're invited because we want the, fo fo the biological parents and the foster parents together so the kids can also see, hey, this is an okay thing. They get along. It's, I'm not having to go back and forth between either of them. I'm not having to, I'm kind of sharing. They're, they both care about me. Um, and we've seen that work really great. Um, we've had foster parents pay for summer camp when the kids return home just to help out mom and dad because they know that money's tight. We've had parents, become, our foster parents become godparents. Um, so we've seen a lot of really great outcomes with the shared parenting. Um, and also we've introduced uh, TBRI, which is the Trust-Based Relational Intervention Therapy, where it meets the complex needs of vulnerable children. Um, we send our foster parents through it, so they're understanding that when the children are coming in, there's going to be a lot of trauma, but there's also going to be a lot of trauma with mom and dad. So we're working with both of them at the same time. So every transition is going to be an easy transition when we go back. Um, 
so I mean, you shared a lot of um, great things there. So I just want to um, maybe highlight a few of those. So QPI, or Quality Parent Initiative, um, I think um, Linda, my admin support here, um, put in a description of that in the chat box. And, and also, can you submit the, um, maybe towards the end of the, of the webinar, the, the, the link for QPI? I mean, you can also look in our Family Drug Court blog, and I posted some information about QPI. But I think what the most important thing to hear about that or to know about that is that it does reflect an agency philosophy. So that's, that's one of the things that we want to emphasize today is that um, in many communities, the idea of shared parenting and engaging with um, resource parents, um, unless there's an agency philosophy or unless there's a, in the KC Foundation, they like to call it a um, partnership um, or a um, partnership culture, there's not the systematic approach or philosophy about um, shared parenting, then we're leaving um, birth parents and resource parents to kind of negotiate and navigate that on their own. And that's really, really challenging. So to be able to kind of sustain a lot of these innovative practices and effective um, partnerships, um, there has to be a um, agency commitment to this type of approach. So I think KPI for many communities has done that. Um, I think the, the other thing I want to highlight with Darcy is, you know, just their intentionality in terms of engaging and, and including um, resource parents and activities. So it is this evidence of we're in this together. Um, we see this, we see families and kids as a, as, as, as a set, as a, as a whole package. So um, I want to highlight that too. And I also want to give you the opportunity to talk about um, the foster parent report that um, your judge, um, Judge Dupanche, um, um, started. And this goes to how we give resource parents a voice or how do we actually listen to what they have to um, share, the, the important things that they um, have to say and share. Um, can you say a little bit about the foster parenting report that you implement in your yeah. family treatment? Um, one of the things that when we started QPI was we had a whole bunch of uh, groups come together, foster parents, bio parents, uh, CASAs, DCFS workers, and we had a lot of focus groups. And one of the biggest things that the, the foster parents were saying is we don't feel like we have a voice in the courtroom. So Judge DePlanche was like, okay, great, let's, let's make this work. So he, we came together, we developed the fostering parenting report, which is giving the foster parent a voice in the courtroom. Uh, it's, it's, two, it's two pages. It's a whole bunch of questions that they get to answer um, about the child, about any concerns they have about the child, any concerns that they might have about the transition of going home, school, uh, illnesses that might, that might be, you know, have happened or are ongoing. But Judge Aponte takes that very seriously in court. He reads it. He addresses it. He speaks to the DCFS worker about it. Um, because some of the, the foster parents that are in our area couldn't make it to court, and they felt like they couldn't get their voice heard. And they were saying, okay, we're telling our DCFS workers this, but we don't feel like they're telling the judge. So now what they do is whenever they're going up to court, that, that, uh, that the foster and parent report gets delivered with the actual court report. So he has the court report and the foster and parent report on the bench with him. So you'll actually see him reading it and asking questions as he goes. And if there's a CASA, he also has that CASA report with him too. So he has three reports in front of him. Oh. And it's come in handy. We have parents, foster parents who fill it out every single time. Um, we have, we've had foster parents that have asked for it. You know, I just want to let the, my voice known. Um, it also helps that, you know, if we have a biological parent that doesn't feel comfortable having the, the foster parent in the courtroom, it's very intimidating having them in there, um, that they don't necessarily need to be in there, that their voice is already being heard. So it gives them a reason that they don't have to go. Uh, it has, we've seen it work really great. 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 So again, one concrete strategy that has worked in Lafayette Parish and something that you can implement in your in your, your um, program. Just one question: What was the name of that therapy again? Um, that's from um, Kathleen. Can you can you? Oh, the TBRI trust-based relational intervention therapy. Trust yep. Okay. Great. Um, it was developed by uh, Catherine Purvis yep. out of CCU. In Texas. 
Interesting. It's, it's you can get trained on it in Texas. Also, they'll bring trainings to you too. Let's not miss the fact that um, it was an agency-wide or agency or program-wide um, training, and um, everyone got trained on it, the judge and, and also the resource parents. So. Well, our judge got trained on it. For, he went to the week-long training about two years ago, and then we brought in a trainer to train multiple people within Lafayette Parish. And then now, once a month, we offer our – actually, an organization called Crossroads NOLA has – partnered with different areas throughout Louisiana to hold a day-long training once a month on different subjects that are all, that implement TBRI. Right. So anybody can go to those trainings. Thanks, Darce. Um, Antoinette, um, what are you doing in Milwaukee County that, um, that you're proud of or excited um, about? So, Within the last year in Milwaukee County, they implemented the Family Preservation uh, Specialist Program. And what they do is an icebreaker with the resource parents as well as the birth parents. And what they usually do is during the, the visits, the family preservation workers will go out and they will do visits with the parents. And pretty much they kind of prep them to meet the actual resource parent so that they can know who's actually taking care of their child. Um, so they do a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the resource parent and the birth parent, whether that be the mom and the dad or just the dad or just the mom. And they have an icebreaker. It can be in the form of a lunch. It can be a, in a form of a meeting and they kind of just get to know each other. Uh, and again, the, the actual parent is able to tell the foster parent, here's what my child likes. Here's their favorite meal. If they don't like this, they don't like um, beans, they don't like eating vegetables. They just kind of have a meet and greet with each other. Um, what's good about that is that the parent then have another person that they can speak to, another person that they can to support them. Um, it's, it has been very successful since they implemented this. Um, some, some parents don't want to meet the foster parent. Some parents become angry and they, like, like Oren said, they want to adopt my child. And usually when we're able to engage them, to let them know, hey, this person is in and in the same system with you in order to help you, it usually turns around and the, and the parent has someone that they can kind of reach out to. They can call their child at night. They can um, speak to their child before they go to bed. They can call their child, and they build a relationship. We have one family who the parent is able to go to the foster parent's home and help them prepare them for school in the morning. So it, it just, it becomes about engaging and trusting and building those relationships with each other, with the family preservation person and or the case manager, getting involved in, and kind of mediating and saying, hey, here are some tools that you can use uh, to the resource parent, or here are some tools that you can use to help to continue to build that trust with the foster parents and the uh, parents. And again, it promotes relationship. It helps the child understand, hey, it's okay for me to love this foster parent. It's okay for me to love my mom. And, and there's no guilt there for that child. So that child is loved by not only their parents, but you have someone else for that child to love as well. Wow. So it is it, it's working. Great. That's great. And um, I think Antoinette's um, um, her sharing of the icebreaker answers a question that we got from Crystal here in terms of how do you, what's the strategy to support foster parents into a position of feeling safe and. We know these transitions, um, and you know we can talk about supportive transitions, but there is an opportunity and a role for resource parents 
to provide supportive transition. So this transition from the removal to, um, to placement, I mean, that's a time of crisis for sure. Um, but icebreaker meetings are a way for um, many um, child welfare agencies implement that. I think in QPI they call, um, they also use comfort calls as a way to um, make those important bridges, connections during that first 24, 48 hours of, of placement. Um, Antoinette, are you a QPI, excuse me, QPI community too? Yes, we are. And do you, what, do you want to add anything in terms of why your, why your community um, decided to adopt that systems change initiative? Um, any just, if you want to add to maybe what Darcy talked about in Lafayette Parish, but with that. Sure. Next, uh, um, so as Darcy was saying, there's um, a permanency plan that is completed every six months for a child and the foster parents or the resource parents um, are allowed to write up a description of what's going on with this child in my home and that report also go to the door to the judge and the judge addresses addresses it in court in milwaukee county qpi is it it works really well with the visitation uh, portion of the work that we do. Um, it allows parents to feel, instead of children actually going to an agency to do visits, it allows the resource parents and the parents to actually team together and take the child out in the community. And it makes parents feel um, it normalizes what's happening. If you're not going to an agency because we don't, families don't parent in an agency. They parent in the community. Uh, and so allowing those resource parents to sometimes supervise the parents with their child um, is helpful in QPI. So it, is, it works well in the visitation um, arena in Milwaukee County. I love that. I mean, you parent in the in the context of community, not within an agency. So, I mean, that's I love that. Um, before we go to Orrin, just one more thing about icebreakers, and maybe Orrin, I think he, when we were planning for this call, you were talking about icebreakers too. But um, when you're doing icebreakers, especially with families that are struggling with active um, substance use or recent um, substance use, what kind of accommodations in terms of scheduling? Um, um, do you have, or Darcy, or even Orrin, um, regarding icebreakers and scheduling for families that are struggling with these substances still? I know you usually those schedules are within 48, 24 or 48 hours. Um, how do you accommodate that schedule given the, given the nature of the disease and you know, the situation? So this is Antoinette, I'll answer that. So when we think of families that are struggling with substance use disorder. Prepping them, prepping the parents and saying, hey, we need to, to be as abstinent as possible during your visits. So we don't want you to attend a visit or meet anyone if you are having cravings. Well, not having cravings, but if you are not uh, absent, absent. So going to a visit and understanding that you have a visit with your child and this is the expectation. So usually we're not talking about individuals who are not using. We have parents who are using, but prepping them for these visits and prepping them for these icebreakers is something that the case managers have to be um, educated. They need to know what they're doing. And so um, a lot of times we don't have any issues with parents who are 
quote unquote hot or belligerent or whatever the terms that's being thrown out there with parents who are have substance use disorder. Parents know that, hey, there's something that I need to do. I need to see my child and I know the expectation is for the visitation worker and or the case manager to know that I haven't used. Yeah. And so the you know, setting them expectations and those boundaries for everyone has been helpful for um, visitation and then for any other types of means. We know, you know, if you know what you're doing uh, when you're working with substance use disorder, you can really get engage your parents to understand that there's an expectation of me that when I see my visit, when I see my child, or when I'm meeting with the foster parent, and which will bring me to the opportunity to engage or to teach foster parents um, about substance use disorder because yeah. some foster parents don't understand it. So. I don't want to go into that right now. So, no, Angela, that, that's really good, and I, I appreciate your what you have to say about that that preparation and that um, you know, just the expectations of of birth parents and how we prepare them for those um, important, you know, important meetings, important you know, um, opportunities like family time. Um, Rise Magazine again. We, we want to point to some of the resources on our, our blog, but um, Rise Magazine, which is written by um, birth parents for birth parents that are involved in the child welfare system, has a set of resources on how to prepare um, birth parents for quality um, parenting time or family time with their kids. So check those out um, when you have a chance. Thank you, Antoinette. Why don't we go to Oren? Um, what are you doing in um, in Miami Dade County um, that you're proud of, or um, that you're excited to share with with the audience. Well, first I want to introduce the term therapeutic jurisprudence, which probably many of you in the audience know. The idea of therapeutic jurisprudence is that the judges work in a way to try to provide treatment intervention and not just punishment intervention. And I'm pleased to say that through uh, our attending a number of courses together, that means the uh, the providers, the treatment providers in the county, along with the judges, attending many, many hours of courses together and having many conversations, most of our judges are lined up with this idea of therapeutic jurisprudence. The Family Resource Center uh, provides therapy inside of our dependency drug court here in Dade County and also our felony domestic violence court in, here in Dade County. And so one thing that we do try to do is to effectuate the icebreaker as soon as it seems practical and safe. So we do try and do an assessment with, let's say, a substance abusing parent. We need to make sure that they're going to be, as Annette said, abstinent from drugs uh, uh, before they meet the, uh, the foster family. We have to make sure that whatever their rage is has been talked about and uh, resolved because we don't want them scaring the foster parents. Um, so. Early on when we tried this, um, judges put them together too quickly and a certain number of biological parents raged at the foster parents or came in intoxicated and that didn't go well. So now we have a process where we definitely structure the expectations appropriately for the birth parents, make sure they're abstinent of drugs, and make sure they understand that the foster parents are, are support, they're on their team, they're not trying to take their kids away. And then we also have to reassure the foster parents that, they will, that they'll be meeting a birth parent who's in control of himself or herself. Um, and I, nevertheless, obviously, it's sometimes awkward for the first few sessions. It's sometimes a little frightening to the uh, biological parent who is not certain whether or not the foster parent is an enemy. But we do try and reassure them that the uh, foster parent is there to help them. So what we're proud of is that um, the extent to which Foster parents have been able to become mentors and uh, be able to become allies is excellent. And we're doing this, as I say, in the dependency drug court and in the uh, felony domestic violence court. And we're getting better than average uh, success rates. And I think among the reasons are 
is that we do meet once a week with the client. Instead of the traditional once every month or every three months checking in, we do meet once a week, and that accelerates the intensity of the um, intervention. And that, frankly, the, the uh, clients uh, resolve their issues more quickly with that much intervention in their lives. Um, so I'm hoping I answered the question. Thank you, Oren. Um, OK, so this is, um, I'm loving the discussion here. And please, again, feel free to submit any questions that you may have on the chat. And um, we have staff here from CFS and also um, NTAC tracking those questions. Um, why don't we go to, why don't we round back up to Darcy? And is there an area that you feel like he, your team or your community needs to work on? So is there an opportunity for improvement, or is there an area that, you, um, that you'd like to see happen in terms of um, engaging and partnering with resource parents? Darce? Yeah, thanks. Um, I always think there's room for improvement. Uh, they, um, I think there's a lot of education that needs to be given to uh, resource parents. Uh, I think they have a hard time understanding a lot of what we do and why we do it. Um, I think that once they they understand why the children came into care, they understand why they're fostering the child or why they're sharing shared partner uh, parenting with these with the biological parents, but I don't think they don't quite understand the whole picture of the rehabilitation of the parents and why we're working with these parents to reunify the children with them. Um, and I, I think that's very hard for them sometimes to grasp that mom had a relapse and, you know, we're still re working toward reunification. Why is that? Is, she, is the child in danger? Why are we still, you know, placing? Or we've placed the child back with mom and she had a relapse 30 days later. And I think that with, you know, I don't know if it's just with our program or all programs or DCFS in general, that that is one thing that we're lacking is the education component. Though we do try to go into DCFS as much as possible and train and other organizations around Lafayette and train um, as much as we can because we want, we want the community to understand that, you know, substance abuse is a disease, that it's not a choice, and that these parents are not making a choice to pick their drugs over their children. Um, and that, you know, our court and DCFS are trying our best to provide the services for the, for the, uh, for the parents and for the children. Um, and that education is key for not only the parents, but for also the foster parents. But I, I think that's one of the things that we're really lacking in our area. Um, I think it's still just people don't want to talk about it in our area. It's very taboo. Um, um, we're a very close-knit, Lafayette is a very close-knit community. People brush things under the rug. They don't want to talk about it. Um, so that, that's really what we run into. We've had foster parents really fight us tooth and nail about reunification. We've had a foster parent hire a private investigator before trying to prevent a child going home. Uh, you know, we've had some pretty strange things happen, but at the end of the day, if the parent works their case plan and the parent works their treatment plan, then they've done their job and they've done what they're supposed to do as a parent. And that's, at the end of the day, we've done our job too. So uh, my answer would be education. I'd like to also chime in on that, if I may. Uh, sure. One of the things I've seen a lot, both with the staff and with the judges, is this idea of vicarious traumatization or secondary traumatization, where people don't realize who deal with this degree of morbidity day in, day out, with child abuse, with injury, with trauma, they don't realize how upset they get in the long run. And some of the mental health professionals realize it because they've had some training in what's referred to as counter-transference. Most of the judges are oblivious to it, but it comes out and they're becoming short-tempered and they're blaming of the staff. 
And, I, and we have had meetings in which this has been openly discussed with the judges who have done some damage to the relationship when they've raged at foster parents because things didn't, uh, or raged at uh, staff because things didn't turn out the way were originally ordered. And so I do think that to make this system work, there has to be a recognition of the degree of, of trauma that this subject matter sometimes visits on people. It also sometimes uh, tears the scab off of old wounds that they may have had in their own lives in terms of trauma, and it makes it hard for them to carry on in an objective way. And therefore, I think the professional staff, as well as the judiciary, needs to be aware of the potential to get overwhelmed by their emotions in dealing with this subject matter day in and day out. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, Oren. Um, I think each of you highlighted two training um, topics. And um, Darcy, I think your response is, in some ways, the biggest opportunity um, for uh, many jurisdictions, it's, it's but uh, opportunities for family treatment courts. You know, we talk about family treatment courts as being the catalyst for larger systems change, but um, I think um, your teams are well positioned to educate the larger systems in the community about um, the nature of the disease and the recovery process, and about lapse and relapse, and how that's how that relates to safe parenting. And so, those are things that, of course. Um, awareness and education are critically important. So I think this idea of, of training and having um, um, that um, offered and, mm -hmm. and on a continuous basis to all partners, including parents, is a huge opportunity. Thanks for highlighting that. Um, I saw somebody ask a question if we had uh, revamped our training. And actually, it, when QPI was brought into our area in 2016, I guess the training which changed, it, we originally used what they called the, the MAP training. Um, it was revamped. Um, and it's an ongoing process of revamping the training. And so we have, in the last two years, brought in the newer, uh, newer foster parents into the area, the new, and recruitment. And there, I will say the newer, newer foster parents that are coming in have a better idea of the shared parenting and understanding of what we are trying to do as a as a unit as a whole um, in the system, uh, but there we we still do run into the foster parent who we we just we can't do anything with that you know they still don't understand. Um, and and Russ, let, can I add? Um, I think yep. this is also an opportunity for foster parents to understand um, the science of addiction and how addiction works on the brain. So there's going to be relapse. Um, right. I don't think that we talk en enough about behavior changes um, and how when a family first came into care or children were removed from their parents, uh, and how their be behaviors were prior to getting treatment and, and after they relapsed, what does that mean? And how did their be behaviors change then? Uh, I think it's important for us to always talk about how, one, when they came into care, the parents, and when they, they obtained treatment and they relapsed and what changed at that point. So if, if that makes sense to you, to you guys, how we need to talk more about behavior changes and how that the brain operates in drug treatment. Well, that's great. Um, Antoinette, um, mm -hmm. opportunities for improvement or change in your, um, in your program community or team? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, um, what are some opportunities um, for change or improvement in Milwaukee? I was I will also piggyback off of D Darcy um, and how we train the foster parents and educate them on shared parenting. 
I think that's a great opp- this is a great opportunity to do more of that within the system. Um, and Oren, feel free because I remember you you, you brought up um, your adoption experience. But in terms of let's talk a little bit about recruitment, and maybe this is an, an area also for for change or improvement. But how um, in terms of being able to to evaluate the motivations? So there's multiple motivations for one to do something um, like foster parent or resource parenting. I mean, it's clearly not um, an easy task. In many ways, it's a calling. But how have um, any of your jurisdictions dealt with the with the motivation of, of, of actually adoption? And we've been hearing this from um, um, many communities where the motivation for to adopt a child in in foster care has actually negatively impacted the reunification process. But um, anyone want to talk about how they've managed that? Well, I'd be glad to talk a little bit about Miami's experience. For starters. When privatization occurred in the summer of 2005, the state of Florida handed over to uh, the district 850 foster homes. And we evaluated the 850 foster homes and found that 250 of them were worthless. They were either in it for the money or possibly predators. So we uh, unlicensed and depopulated 250 homes right away. Uh, and then it gradually whittled down. We knocked out another 150 over the next year or so. So we brought it back down to around 350 homes. I think the way to optimize recruitment is that, who, that the people that you hire to do the recruitment have to go out to the right audiences. And in our experience, the right audiences have been either the faith-based community or the large municipalities who have workers who have a sense of community service. And our experience has been if the recruiters stay in their office and work from their computers, they will be worthless to the test. They need to be out there on Saturdays and Sundays. They need to be talking to the faith-based community. They need to be talking during the weekdays to, for example, Miami-Dade County. We've got a lot of uh, prospective foster parents by going to various divisions. There are many thousands of employees employed by Miami-Dade County. And each of the, each of the cities within Miami-Dade County also have a number of very service-minded people. So the first thing is go where the service-minded people are and talk to them about uh, becoming a foster parent. The second thing that we have discovered is very useful is to have a relatively long uh, training period. We use uh, a, a program which many people use, a PRIDE program, which is a minimum of 10 sessions at three hours apiece. And in addition to teaching the didactic issues about learning how to parent and co-parent, also get to see about their motivations. And we have found sometimes the motivations are pure and their hearts are pure. Sometimes the motivations are for money and we weed them out. So my advice is to make sure you have a relatively elongated process where you have lots of contact with the enrollees, with the uh, prospects, to make sure you get a real good sense of their motivation. Oh. Orrin, we got a question about um your process for evaluation when, you know, the transition to privatization and you were evaluating a set of, of foster or resource um, homes. How, you want to say anything about that process? How did you determine that they were they weren't worthless or didn't have a, um, they shouldn't be in that position? Yes. Um, there were a couple of things that stood out. For example, uh, a certain number of homes already had issues where investigators had come out to the home several times a year, and there were some fairly serious allegations. And at least in the state of Florida, the way it works is unconfirmed, unconfirmed with some findings, and then confirmed. Well, we were alarmed to see that in a number of cases, it would be unconfirmed with some findings. Because if you have that happen three times a year, you start to think with all that smoke, then there's fire, and we start to get worried about that. The second thing is that uh, I'm sure all the states have a detailed home study checklist. And when we did the detailed home study checklist that's prescribed by the state, these homes were not passing. The homes, they either had roaches or they had leaks or they had a tremendous amount of fungus or mold, or they didn't, they didn't have refrigerator systems that worked, in other, or, or they didn't have gates 
at the tops of stairs or banisters. So there were many defects structurally where these homes should never have passed inspection. And when we tried to give them a cure period, we tried to give them a week or two or three to cure the issue, it turned out they didn't have enough money to cure the issue and they really were not motivated to cure the issue. So one is the call out to the homes, the second is the um, uh, degree to which they satisfied the home studies, and the third was talking to the kids. If they were of age, you would talk to the kids how they're treated, and obviously you have to talk to them out of earshot of the foster parents. You have to talk to them someplace where they're safe. Um, and if they're too young, then you would also talk to the pediatricians to see if there have been suspicious injuries or indications of maltreatment. Um, sometimes we've gone and talked to the teachers and found out whether the kids have sometimes, what the teachers have said to us, the kids have come in wearing the same clothes, you know, three, four, five days. They come in where they haven't eaten or they come in and it's clear they haven't had a shower or a bath. So we looked at it as sort of a multi-parametric investigation. Sure. Sure. And we found that 250 of those 850 homes were not suitable. Sure. I mean, it sounds like that that was, I mean, absolutely necessary. Um, thank you, Oren. Um, so we're getting um, a stream of questions. And again, submit them in, in the chat box. Um, we have a little less than 15 minutes left. Um, so I want to open it up to that. So um, Darcy, Oren, and Antoinette, um, any responses to the question about the amount of information that's provided to um, resource parents about the family treatment court case, well, the, the dependency case, but the, um, also maybe what, um, what they're doing or how they're progressing in family treatment court? Do you want to talk about communication and maybe any issues or concerns about confidentiality? How, how do you keep resource parents surprised, but also knowing about um, you know, sensitive um, information too. Well, we asked them to come to court. We asked them to come to court to hear what's going on. And they do have to sign a pledge to not disclose it to anyone else. But we would like them to be apprised of what's going on. And uh, very often they are very useful sources of information to the court. And, and, and that overall has worked for resource parents and birth parents in terms of inviting them to court. I think that's, um, I mean, that's, that's one strategy that has worked in, in, in other communities. But that's working in, in Miami-Dade? I would say it's worked most of the time. But on some occasions, obviously, the birth parent will become angry and feel betrayed. But there's that okay. same dynamic between the case manager and the birth parent, that sometimes when the case manager reports things to the judge that the birth parent doesn't want revealed, then the birth parent feels betrayed. But just the same, we have to speak the truth because overall we're advocating for the kids. Thanks, Lauren. So in Milwaukee County, we um, invite the foster parents to the permanency plan hearings and give, and they're sitting there so they can hear exactly what's being said about the parent. But um, the case manager is not allowed to share um, day-to-day -day information about the parents due to confidentiality. Um, but the foster parents are always welcome to come to the permanency plan hearing, not the actual weekly family treatment court uh, staffing. Uh, with ours, ours don't come to the, to the staffing czar, to, to the review hearings every other week. Uh, but there's an open line of communication with the workers and the, the resource parents. Uh, they're pretty up to date on what's going on. Um, just they feel as though that the parents, you know, they need to know the progress of the case. Um, it's one of the, the, when we began QPI in Lafayette Parish, it was one of the things that was talked about was the line of communication between the foster parents and the birth parents is, the birth, the foster, or the resource parents kind of felt like they were being left in the dark um, about the progress of the case and where it was going. And so it, it was brought up that, you know, they would be a little, kept up a little more up to date. Um, but it has to be given through this certain channels. It just can't be anyone telling them. But 
I will say it, it's worked out. I, I haven't seen any issues with it where the foster parents have got, I mean, the uh, bio parents have gotten upset or anything. And a majority of the time, I've with our our clients, they're okay with them knowing. Um, they haven't felt hurt or deceived or anything. Also in Milwaukee County, the foster F for share parenting happens. Um, the parents are usually engaged with the foster parents, and so they pretty much know what's, what's going on in that parent's life. And the resource parent or foster parent is able to be a support to that parent. If they are relapsing, they are able to call that foster parent and, and talk to them about, hey, this is what's going on with me, and, you know, use them as a, as a, as a support for them. So it works out if the parents and foster parents are engaged with each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've seen that too, since there's been a better line of communication with the shared parenting that they're more willing to share now. Yeah, yeah. This gets back to this um, agency culture or this culture of, of a partnership culture. Once you're able to establish that, and it may not even be agency-wide, maybe it's just within the family treatment court, but once you're able to kind of establish those kind of expectations, um, some of these things get actually resolved. So, um, can I get putting on that? Um, we're getting a question in terms of how do you how do you train? So, this importance of training is important, and and if you're if you're trying to achieve kind of systemic change, of course, and you start with recruitment. What do you do with that pool of 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 resource parents that are already um, in, involved? They've been um, resource parents for for many years, um, and they plan to continue, but how do you, any any ideas or strategies on how do you partner with experienced um, um, resource parents, and how do you get them to maybe change their thinking about some things? With, that, when, with, with us, when QPI was brought into the area, we did see a decline in the older foster parents. Uh, they They really didn't like the um the idea of it they they didn't like what was being asked of them um they so we saw a real decline in it but when uh the agent we a couple of nonprofits around our area uh crossroads nola and fostering love came in and started doing a lot of the recruitment and you know a lot of the faith faith-based air arenas they we we saw a real rise in it um we also have what we call a fostering mentor which is we have a couple of older foster parents who have started kind of a support group for foster parents and they meet occasionally once a month once every other month where they get together at a, a mutual place a neutral place and they have like a potluck and they they get together and discuss all kinds of issues or you know success stories that they've had um bring up questions, and that, that foster mentor, the head foster mentor is actually employed by our Family Resource Center here in town, and they bring it back to the Family Resource Center, and they kind of discuss those issues and see what they can be done about them, if any resources can be brought out into the community, what, you know, how can we resolve some of the problems that they're seeing, and that's really helped, too, is it's, you know, we're all in this together, um, you know, with the parent partners that work with the parents, the fan, uh, the um, fostering mentors, the older foster parents, those have really worked too. I mean, it's, they work together and it, it's worked out well for them. We have five minutes so, left and I want to give, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Antoinette, go, go ahead. So I was just going to say in Milwaukee County, they also have the older foster parents to, who are mentors for our newer foster parents. Um, we also um, do a lot of uh, uh, we do a lot of email. There's an email chain that goes out with foster parents. It's called um, the Foster Parent Connect page, and so when foster parents are having issues, they can go on that page. If they need resources for anything, they can go on the um, 
the email page to uh, engage with each other that way. Great. So we have five minutes left. We should um, finish up here. So I want um, we want to hear from our panelists one more time, and I'm going to give them a chance to kind of collect their thoughts. But in one sentence, um, what's your advice to um, the family treatment core teams if they want to better partner with resource parents? So give that um, a thought, um, one sentence, um, and then um, I want to make a couple announcements. So a couple things. Um, so normally we release a pre-recorded um, video presentation on um, on this topic and it provides an overview of concepts. And so unfortunately we weren't able to do that um, prior to this live event. Um, and the reason for that is because we interviewed um, a birth and foster mother um, or resource um, parent here in Orange County, um, a graduate from the Family Treatment Court and also um, their story of working with with a birth with a birth and foster parent. So um, that story, I think, is going to inspire um, anyone that listens to it. And we're just finishing up our edits on that. So we hope to get that done in the next week. Um, we'll make sure that we send out the link to everyone that um, participated in this webinar. So just FYI regarding that. Um, again, we have a ton of resources on our FTC blog. Um, Linda, can you go ahead and post the link to that blog? Um, we know that there's a lot of resources about this topic of, of engaging with um, resource parents. I think the opportunity for us as Family Treatment Court um, practitioners is how can we better um, increase the awareness of, of important topics like trauma, important topics of family recovery, of the treatment process, um, of substance use disorders as a brain disease. I think that's um, opportunities for us. Um, so, before I send it over to Adam and Entac, um, one sentence, or maybe I'll give you two sentences um, regarding um, advice to, um, to the field. Um, Darce. Um, staying involved with one another helps everyone with their emotions after their transition, after the reunification. Thank you. Um, Antoinette. I think it's important for us to um, remember why we do the work that we do, and it's to uh, keep families together, and if we can't do that, to um, find alternative placement for children, but to always think of how important it is for a child to always know who their parents are. Thank you. And then finally, Orrin. I think we should be guided by the principle of teaching the biological parents, and for that matter, the foster parents, loving with appropriate limits. We want to be patient, but we want to be loving with appropriate limits. Wow. Thank you. Again, feel free to um, check out any of our resources. We have a take action guide, so um, we're offering some next steps in terms of you and your team can engage in, and we link that with some resources, so please check out that guide. If you didn't get to your question, um, we'd be happy to provide a um, direct response. I think there was one question. Uh, I'm getting a copy of the training report. We'll follow up with you on that. Um, we have a transcript of the, of the chat and um, find out um, who actually submitted that and get that to you. So with that, again, thank you for your investment of your time. And hopefully, again, you got a return. Hopefully, you heard something that was um, helpful or inspiring. Um, thank you to our panelists. Um, and thank you for your work in your communities. Um, Adam, you want to take it over? Great. Thank you so much, uh, Russ, and to each and every one of the participants and presenters today. Just a few announcements before we close out. I uh, wanted to post up here for you the intact contact information if you have additional questions. You can also check us out on Facebook. Um, we also have a TTA help desk that's available. You have the phone number and email address on the screen, as well as the website for OJJDP.gov. Um, and should you have a training or technical assistance need, you can submit a request via online platform, OJJDP TTA 360. The web address is there on the slide for you. 
Again, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and is going to be posted on Intact's YouTube page. You can also request the transcript and supporting materials by contacting the help desk. And please take a moment to review this disclaimer slide. And finally, we'd appreciate if you could take five minutes to complete our online evaluation. Again, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon.